Hello everyone, this is Doris Parfait Claude from Anchor. I'm the Government Relations Manager. With me today I have Linda Plord and Steve Crow. So we're going to get started on the webinar now. Um, we have, the speakers we have are Linda Plord, who began her career in 1982 in the state of Maine as a program director for Powell Memorial Center and later as an administrator for Ojai. Following a move to California, Linda worked for Alta C California and North Bay Regional Centers for a combined 15 years. In 2006, she became the executive director of Bayberry Incorporated, where she is right now. She's participated in several social media campaigns, including around California's Lanterman Act, and we'll discuss those today. Linda is an active member of the North Bay Regional Center of Board of Directors, the California Supported Living Network, and is a member of Anchor's Board of Directors. Steve Kroll has nearly three decades of experience in federal and state policy development, advocacy, and trade association leadership. From December 2014 to April 2017, he served as the executive director of NYSARC, which is the largest developmental disability service organization in New York. Steve was also the managing leader of the uh, statewide Be Fair to Direct Care Workforce Coalition, and that's the experience he will be talking about today. He currently serves as the Vice Chair of the Board of uh, Cobble Skills Regional Hospital and as a volunteer EMT. So let me do a quick check. Steve, Linda, I have you on? Yes. Yes, good afternoon. Great. Um, so we're going to move on to do some housekeeping now. Um, your audio should be coming through your computer speakers. And if you can't hear us, just make sure that it's your computer volume that's working and there's a dial-in line if need be on the screen. We'll answer questions at the end of the session, and we are recording this webinar, so we'll be able to share the slides and the audio recording, probably right after this webinar, actually. Um, before I dive into the content, though, because it's only an hour-long webinar, I do want to clarify at the start that we're going to be focusing mainly on the big picture, so the potential of social media for your advocacy. However, we do have an appendix at the end of the presentation that has slides on basics like how to open an account, how to send tweets, um, and that kind of content. So when you download the uh, slides after the webinar, you'll be able to see those. However, I can assure you they're really easy, like even if you don't see how to use them in this actual web, during the presentation segment, I did not start actively using Twitter until I started at Anchor about a year and a half ago. And I found that not only has it become a vital part of my arsenal, but it's actually an easy tool. So before we dive into the presentation, we'll start with an overview from Anchor. Then I'll hand things over to Linda and Steve, after which we'll have campaign examples. And then we'll wrap up with questions. Um, and in the meantime, if you need our attention for anything, you should see a little chat box on, the, uh, on your screen, on like the lower um, left side. So if you have questions and whatnot, just ping them over to me from there. Um, so why should you care about social media and online advocacy overall? Um, it's, advocacy is a constantly evolving field, and it opens new channels of communications. So, and what we mean by that is that especially when you're performing advocacy with elected officials, they have a vested interest in taking their constituents' temperatures which means they have an interest in social media because it's that many more thermometers they can monitor. So it can seem frivolous, you know, whenever we see all those tweets like the Kardashians and them or whatnot. But keep in mind that for your elected officials, social media is really serious business. You know, any content, a post, a Facebook post, a tweet, a Snapchat can make its way around the world. That's the concept of becoming viral. Like a lot of people are using it and seeing it. So if it has their name in it, elected officials want to know what it says. So for them, this is actually something that they take seriously. It's a legitimate official channel of communication. Um, and to help us understand this in this new context, I've broken things down into a bit of a divide between old school and new school. So the more traditional methods of advocacy that people have been using until, well, predominantly using until the past decade or so, and then the new tools that have emerged since this decade, and the big difference between them is that one uses in-person more than the other. Um, you know, social media is mostly convenient. It is not as personal. It's 
a written medium, but it is a very significant supplement. Eisenhower once said that sports prepare young people for war, but my take is that sports do not prepare anyone for politics, and that the policy-making process is inherently chaotic. There's no clearly defined teams. Your friends of today will be your enemies of tomorrow, and there is no uh, clear schedule, which means that nobody really knows when the next big issue is going to emerge, much less what it will be about. Um, so when it happens, you know, you're minding your own business, and then suddenly you have this crisis because somebody decided to pass some law that you never heard about. Um, the strength of social media is that when you're having these fast-moving events, you can rapidly respond. You can make a lot of noise quickly, even though it seems like something came out of nowhere at you. Um, So the pros of this, uh, you know, in the, of these methods is that you can share a lot of information. And we're, when we're talking about sharing information, it can be both for persuasion purposes or education. You can change the tone and the nature of your content easily because social media allows you to link your external content, photos, websites, longer articles, infographics. So it's a very flexible medium. And it allows you to reach people, not only a lot of people, but people you've never spoken to before because they're not part of your day-to-day -day networks. Um, so you can make something public and have the whole world see it, or you can tailor it and have your message be seen by those passionate few. It's why it's important to have a strategy before you start. You need to know what you want to say and who you want to say it to because then you can be really effective. And it's a great tool for mobilization in two ways. You can show that you have a lot of people who will, at a heartbeat, come out and say, hey, this is not okay, which any elected official will like, take one look at that and be like, oh, I wonder how many of these people vote. And it's not a chance they're going to want to take it in terms of finding out. So it's inherently a, social media inherently has like a counting nature. It tallies everything. How many emails did you send? How many people saw your videos? How many tweets were sent using this specific content? Um, which allows you to like throw those numbers around and give that further moment of pause, like I have an army. And if you only have a staff of three people, then you can also use it to leverage that. Um, to continue the military analogy, it's a force multiplier. It allows you to take limited resources and maximize their effect. Essentially, you can ask the people of the internet to help you on any campaign. And it's not a demographic to be ignored. Um, John Oliver recently called upon the trolls of the Internet to go uh, torment the FCC on um, net neutrality, and they shut down the website. There were so many comments coming in at the same time. Um, so it's, the people of the Internet are powerful, and you want them on your side. Now, naturally, social media has weaknesses. They're not fatal, though. It's a written medium. So because it's not personal, you have to supplement using photos, using videos. It's why these days you see all these like videos on Twitter. Like, you're opening your page and all these videos just start automatically telling stories. It's becoming a very popular method of that because it's a way of making up for the shortcoming of social media. Um, so again, by being aware of these shortcomings in advance, you can use um, foresight to basically lessen or overcome them. Um, so I'm going to give show this slide briefly that kind of explains like the three most popular platforms in social media, so Twitter, Facebook, and Snapchat, as well as emails. I mean, everybody uses emails, so I don't think you need as much of an explanation on that. I'm not going to dwell on this, though, because you can download it and come back to this later. I am going to spend a little bit of time introducing Thunderclap. Now, you guys might remember back in the day, Anchor actually had a small Thunderclap campaign. What it is? If you're familiar with a flash mob, it's about the online equivalent of that. So a flash mob is when a lot of people just appear um, in one space at the same time and all start doing the same thing. Like you see all these w videos of like the guys at Disneyland proposing to his girlfriend and all his friends start dancing around them. That's a flash mob. This is the online equivalent. It means you can get a bunch of people to post at exactly the same time. The way you use it is by logging into it using your social media. So you would use your Facebook account to log into Thunderclap, give it permission, and only post one message at the specified time that you gave permission for. Um, so it doesn't actually like hack your Facebook or anything. Um, so the example that we gave on the screen, we didn't actually do that, but it gives you an example of its power, right? Like you have somebody who's 
feeling very on the fence, suddenly seeing a bunch of messages all at the same time. It's very hard to ignore. Um, and so I'm using this a small pause to be a broken record and throw back. The reason that we're focusing so much on flexibility is just because not only ha are we seeing a new array of tools, but the way those tools are used itself is changing. So I was discussing Thunderclap earlier in a uh, political campaign, but just maybe six or seven years ago, Facebook was still mostly used by college students who were checking to see if their Q classmate was single. Uh, now it has so many users that if Facebook were a country, it would be the most popular, the most populous nation on earth. It, Twitter, for example, used to be mostly for gossip, so you know, what is the latest celebrity sending out and sharing about their day? But when the Arab Spring rolled around in the, um, a few years ago, it was hailed as the main way that people were spreading the word about protests and like activizing, activating their networks. So it's important to learn about the new uses for tools, but also respect them. Um, so even if you don't really use Facebook for one specific, uh, for a lot of purposes, recognizing that others do will make you have more people join you in the things that are important to you. So even if you use Facebook mostly to share pictures of your grandkids, but you also want to share advocacy messages, like it really doesn't, one does not invalidate the other. And you know, if you have somebody who doesn't want to see your advocacy messages, you can actually change your settings so that people, you can choose who can see what you say. And we have instructions for that in the appendix. But essentially, social media is a way to invite people into your world, regardless of the different facets of your world. You don't do just one thing with yourself and neither the social media, but in order to not step on each other's toes, it's important to recognize that. So having had that little caveat, before I hand things over to Linda and Steve, I want to give you a little bit more of an idea about how social media has grown. 97 out of 100 senators have their own official Twitter accounts. 90% of the House of Representatives, that's like over 400 of the 435, I think the actual statistic had like a weird fraction, like one half of representatives, um, and all but one governor used Twitter. So it gives you some context. It is a very legitimate tool of communication. Having said that, Linda, handing things over to you, and then we'll have Steve speak. Okay. Um, I guess I will switch over to my first Twitter slide. I may need your help with that, Doris. Mm -hmm. All right, let me, there we go. Okay, so yes, I am Linda Plord um, in the Twitter world. I am known as at Plord Linda. I also have a Twitter account for my agency at Bayberry Inc. You know, life has been so different since January 2015. That's when my Twitter life began. I am, um, <clears throat> excuse me, not so much a, a social media person, but in 2015, um, it was a must. I'm a member, a board member of the California Supported Living Network and uh, as part of the Lanterman Coalition in California, which includes other uh, state associations, the California Developmental Services Association, the RQCP Collaborative. We all decided that we needed to have a different way of lobbying in California. Um, California does have a Lanterman Act and uh, you know, typically we would expect that a law uh, would have the funding to, to go along with it. Um, we would expect that, but uh, after decades of rate freezes and no increases, we simply found that showing up on Grassroots Day every April of every year um, simply was not effective. And so um, we decided to take to Twitter by storm and uh, it, it meant hours, hours of each day during that time frame, uh, which was a very expensive time period, um, more than a year waiting for the governor to include us in, in, in the budget. You know, first we're in the budget, then we're out. Uh, then it's special session, and you know, it's, it's an endless it's an endless dialogue about how to fund people services for people with IDD. So it, we took to Twitter, and it was some time taken every single night to tweet our, our legislators, sometimes on the spot. Um, it, it was done in, in, in um, combination with the rallies, with face-to-face -face legislative meetings, showing up at hearings, emailing, phone calls. 
and we would rally all the individuals in California to take part in this. And so it was very effective. In July 2016, we received our first rate increase in more than a decade. And it was more than we anticipated. So we were successful. Um, let me transition to the tweets and um, talk a little bit about them. I wanted to give you a visual for those of you who are not familiar with Twitter. It's actually very, very easy. Um, I was a little fearful at first simply because I'm just not a social media person, uh, much more than Facebook. So the first tweet, um, in September 3, 2015, we had a quite significant rally in California, and we invited former Congressman Tony Coelho to participate along with us and to speak for justice. You can see my message is to the governor, and who would have ever thought that I, Linda Floyd, would be speaking to our governor in any fashion. But here I am on Twitter feeling very confident that I can send my message to him. At Jerry Brown Governor, you are missing a great opportunity to hashtag speak for justice alongside your colleague, Tony Coelho. And I tagged CSLN in this tweet, but as you can see under the picture, I've also tagged uh, nine other parties. And um, those parties included, uh, as you can see, Jackie Dillard Foss, who is with CSLN, and eight other parties, which included possibly other folks from CSLN as well as legislators and legislative bodies, such as California Senate Dems, um, California uh, GOP, and, uh, and the like. So I am sending a message to Governor Brown, you're not here. We invited you, you're not here. You're not speaking for justice. I want to speak about the hashtags. Um, if you search uh, in Twitter, you can search for hashtag speak for justice and you'll get all the messages that are associated with that hashtag. You can see how many people are speaking about that particular topic. Another hashtag for us was um, keep the promise. You'll see that on my next tweet. Um, here again, I'm telling Governor Brown, Jilly came from Napa to tell you how important her community services are. She told Tony Coelho instead. So throwing a little bit of shame on you um, to the governor for not being there and that a former congressman had to come up from Southern California to, uh, to speak along with us and to hear what we had to say. And the next tweet below it is again to Governor Brown, 1,500 people come to you to speak for justice, hashtag speak for justice. You were absent then, don't be absent now. This is when they had thrown us into special session and the dialogue continued and continued and it was endless day after day after day. We used Twitter to um, track those days as well. We would say day four, special session, uh, we're watching, we're keeping an eye on you, we haven't forgotten. And so it was a daily effort just to let them know that we were continuing to watch. The next tweet is um, again to Jerry Brown. I, I think he was my favorite uh, person to tweet to. Um, and at California Senate Dems, we are here, come meet the faces of the Lannerman. So as you can see in the photo, or partially see in the photo, this black box that folks are holding up um, is, is the coffin for the Lannerman Act. Basically, if our services were not funded or we did not receive an increase of some sort, um, the Lannerman Act was in jeopardy, serious jeopardy, after decades of uh, inadequate funding. And so I wanted to send that message uh, that it was very important that they, um, they fund the services. You can see a hashtag, Integrity Matters. Um, I decided to include that hashtag simply because they spoke one way on the floor and they voted differently. So it's like, if you're going to say something, please live up to your word. Okay, so moving on to the next slide. Here, um, it was for a rally in uh, June 2015, um, possible arrests. We had a group of individuals, probably 300 for that rally, not as large as the September 3 rally, but wanting to draw attention to it. We were very noisy. Um, uh, we did have a Senator Bell who had uh, authored a letter to say that they would be in support of uh, increasing funding for our services, and it was signed on by many other legis legislators. And so uh, in, in order to recognize that it was Senator Bell who was our strongest supporter at the time, um, folks from CSLN, uh, you know, Mark Melance and Jackie Dillard Voss in particular thought of bringing cowbells. And so it was a very, very noisy rally. And so they then uh, deemed that we were a credible threat to the governor. And so as you can see in the second tweet on the page, uh, the doors of the Capitol are lined with uh, with officers not letting us in, uh, even our even the folks we support could not go into 
use the bathroom. And so, again, we were deemed a credible threat. And so if you don't have time to draft tweets, it's okay to retweet. As you can see in the first one, I retweeted one from Katie Orr, who is stating protesters now sitting in front of the Capitol, officers try to convince them being arrested won't fix anything. And so retweeting with a message or simply retweeting without a message is fine. Um, if you see at the bottom, there's a little message bubble. You can actually just send a message to Katie or and tag other people in your message, remembering 140 characters. The next one is the retweet symbol. When you hit that, it gives you the option to retweet, simply retweet without any um, added words or to retweet with your 140 characters tagged onto it. The next one is the heart, which means that you like that tweet. And then there's a message symbol where you can message other individuals on Twitter. And moving on to the next slide. Oh, there we go. OK. So for Twitter, gosh, you can use it to give very strong messages to, to your legislators or, uh, you know, um, the people that you want to uh, communicate with. You can use it to simply let them know you're watching. Use some humor. Um, you know, in one of my tweets, I don't have it up here, but uh, at, at one hearing, um, they have spoken about how people who do this work are angels. And so I had posted a tweet um, of a sad angel uh, dressed in very dark clothing, very sad and distraught, depressed, saying, you know, um, we may be angels, but we cannot work without any, uh, any funding. We cannot do this uh, without the appropriate funding. And so um, here is one. To, let's, let's go to the humorous one in the middle. I find it humorous. That's my humor. I was sending it to at, uh, at Tony Atkins, who was an assembly member who worked uh, closely with Governor Brown and the Senate pro tem, Kevin DeLeon. There were the three decision makers. Um, she had posted that they were celebrating summer recess. They were having a, a party that night. And so I simply posted to this lovely gentleman with his party hat, a.k.a. a lampshade, saying, celebrating summer recess tonight, hashtag shameful. You left DD community in the lurch, party on at their expense. They had put us in special session, which meant that it would be many months before we would have a decision about funding. And in the meantime, our services were, um, we were, we were struggling. People were closing their doors. The first tweet. Let them know you're watching. Uh, the Art California had posted this picture. I am on the far left. This was an anchor event testifying on Capitol Hill about the plight of uh, people with uh, developmental disabilities in California and across the country. And so I wanted to bring this photo to the attention of the Assembly GOP, um, Assembly Dems, and of course, Jerry Brown. Um, and so uh, that was one tweet to let them know that the country was watching, not only Californians. And then on the right, uh, a lovely photo of Jackie Dillard's boss and myself uh, there in, at a hearing, smiling because the words on the floor were positive and saying, we are here, we heard you, um, thank you. Um, we had other tweets where our faces were not so smiling. Um, we were frowning, saying we uh, disagreed with what was being said on the floor. Uh, and so we simply needed to let them know that we were there and we were watching and that we were waiting for them to do the right thing for people with disabilities and the people who support them. And I believe I am moving on to my last slide. Say thank you. Use it to say thank you. It's so, so important. Um, in this first slide, Assemblymember Shannon Grove is the person who came out the day we were uh, told by officers that we would be arrested, and she was appalled at the situation and uh, came out to talk to us and said that, uh, actually called off the officers. They all rode away on their horses. And uh, we, I, I wanted to thank her. Honor California's promise to its most vulnerable. Don't keep them waiting. Um, thank you at Shannon Grove for your integrity. And lastly, and bringing it more to the current day, thanking them for protecting Medicaid. Fortunately in California, Senator Dianne Feinstein and Camilla Harris uh, you know, voted uh, to uh, voted against the ACA repeal and replace, and so we wanted to thank them. And so we have various videos from my staff and, excuse me, people that we support, uh, saying thank you. And they're very quick videos, as you can see, 18 seconds, and it's simply to send out a message to them to say thank you for supporting us. And 
I just want to say that Twitter um, actually changed the way that uh, changed the outcome for California, and uh, it's it's a new way of communicating, and it hits millions of people. We don't need to have millions of followers. Um, if your if your tweets are retweeted. Um, you can be guaranteed that even if you only have 10 to 15 or 20 retweets, it'll hit, uh, it could potentially hit hundreds of thousands of people. And so I would strongly encourage folks to be brave, create a Twitter account. It's very, very simple. Have fun with it. I use it mostly for legislative purposes, um, but have fun with it. And uh, this is a way that you can speak with your governor. I mean, again, who would have thought I'd be communicating with Jerry Brown in California? Thank you. And I would like to mention that uh, Linda, actually, in one of her uh, discussions with anchor staff, mentioned that she was recognized by one of her uh, state legislators because of how often she tweeted him. Yes, let me let me just give a, a two-second thing about that. Um, uh, Assembly Member Tony Thurman, I would tweet him, and I wasn't always, you know, I, I was I was very persistent in telling him he had worked in our field before, and so. He knew what we were facing, and and he would speak on the floor very positively, but then would vote differently. And so the tweets um, were not always so kind, I guess. I, they were just very direct. I was never rude. Um, one, one time at the rally, he passed by all of us, and I tweeted, you know, you're passing us by. You're not even stopping to talk to us, and we, we, we would want to talk with you. And so at an event later, this is, gosh, this is last year, I saw him um, at a conference, and I uh, approached him because I wanted to request that he attend uh, a legislative breakfast for CSLN. And he looked at me and said, "I know you. I know you. I recognize you." I had to. I had to because I am so honest. I had to tell him it was from Twitter, and we had a great laugh. He says, "Oh my gosh, you guys were so mean to me." And I said, "Actually, we were just sending you a message. It was not meanness at all." But it just goes to show that they're very affected by the tweets. As a matter of fact, with the billboard, uh, Tony Atkins, Kevin De, De Leon, and uh, Senator um, Governor Brown um, requested that we take them down. They said they were mortified that that billboard was up. And ultimately, we got our increase in July of 2016, greater than we had expected. Okay. So with that, we're going to now hand the mic over to Steve. Are you ready, Steve? Yes, good afternoon. Um, the Be Fair to Direct Care campaign was a statewide campaign involving all of the developmental disability providers and family-based organizations in the state directed at increasing wages for DSPs uh, through an increase in Medicaid funding. It was um, w really the signature campaign in the New York State Legislature in 2017, and we won an overwhelming victory. Um, with the state agreeing to invest more than $100 million in increased Medicaid spending and DSP wages over the next several years. Uh, when we began this campaign, um, it's a very similar story to what Linda talked about in California. Uh, we used rallies to turn people out. We used traditional grassroots letter writing and telephone calls and attending hearings and meetings to motivate our population, and we also began experimenting in social media. And social media really became the thing that tipped the balance for us. When we began the campaign and began talking to experts in um, the legislative process in the state, uh, we were told we were prepared to spend 4 to $5 million on a campaign if we were going to get the kind of penetration and recognition that we needed, because essentially we had a state legislature that um, was not specifically aware of the developmental disability community, and we were just dif we were undifferentiated healthcare workers like everybody else in healthcare. They didn't see us as anything different, um, and we had to change their mind to get them to understand who we are and what we are. And also, a governor um, that simply didn't have money to spend or didn't have want to spend any money, and simply wasn't interested in um, someone coming to talk about increased spending. Uh, it's the social media that really changed it for us, and I'll show you some tweets and talk about those tweets and how it really turned the tables for us because what we were told might cost 4 or $5 million and then you might have a chance to win, we did for under $250,000. Um, and most of that is because of our ability to connect with people using Facebook and Twitter. Um, you can see in this first slide um, some, some of my sample tweets. 
Um, one of the first things we did was real people, real stories. And I will tell you, I was a skeptic of using Twitter because I was one of the people that said you can't do anything in 140 characters. But I'm surprised at looking back just how effective we were communicating a message in 140 characters. Um, and um, what, we were, what I did not realize is when you tweet, you can attach pictures, and a picture is worth a thousand words, and you can attach videos, and you can link to newspaper articles. Anytime we had a good story to tell, we linked to it. So we simply asked people in the community to make short videos and talk about what their DSPs mean to them, or ask DSPs to make videos about how much they loved their job, but they did not make a, earn a living that was – they were able to sustain working with us. So we looked for real people and real stories. So a great example is we had a blizzard in March, uh, late season, heavy snowfall in upstate New York. Um, and I, I just I met a DSP who told me that uh, she, she knew she had to be at work, so she left three hours early and she walked five hours through the blizzard to not miss her shift. And I tweeted it to the governor, and I tweeted it to my Twitter followers, and it got out there. Um, and so those are just some examples of tweets on that first slide there that we use to get people to tell their stories. And it's not something you need a commercial video production crew to do. I walked around New York State, and my colleagues walked around New York State with our smartphones. We took little clips of people sending a message. We posted them, and then people started sending them around. And everything was tagged to the governor's Twitter account, at New York of Cuomo. And the governor office monitors Twitter. We know that because they would call us when they saw something on Twitter they didn't particularly like uh, about um, the attitude that may have been used. So they were counting, they were watching, and so we knew it was getting through. So those are some of the tweets. Uh, so real people, real stories is my first thought. My second thought to share is build an online community. Um, Every place that I spoke, every place that I met with a group, I asked, I asked the audience how many of you were on Twitter. Um, in most cases, there were a very small group of people and the audience would raise their hand. And we essentially asked everybody to join Twitter, even if it's just for this purpose. And we said, you don't even have to do, you don't ever have to post a tweet. All you need to do is follow us and retweet it. And so we, we, we got over a million social media hits in one month from our work on Facebook and Twitter at a particular time in the campaign, at the critical time in the campaign, just because people were picking up what we did and sending it around. So uh, we, we, we basically would tweet and say, everybody retweet this to the governor. He knows that our, and our hashtag was be fair, fair to direct care won't stop. Um, and this is one of our ways of saying we're going to stand tall and fight. So we had a rally in Brooklyn. We used Twitter to promote it. The rally in Brooklyn – we got about three or four hundred, five hundred people. We packed the room, but it still it wasn't ten thousand people on the steps of the Capitol. Um, it wasn't um, it wasn't massive a massive protest that other interest groups might be able to bring forth. Um, in New York State, the healthcare workers union can fill a ten thousand seat arena on just about any given day just by busing everybody there. We knew we couldn't match those numbers, but what we were able to do is we tweeted the rally. We would take pictures of the rally, and we would take little video clips of a speaker that was speaking and tweet that out. By the time we got to the end of the campaign, people were coming to our rallies to be heard so that they could get their little Twitter clip up there. So we would have members of the state legislature all coming. We would have 10 or 12 of them lined up, all of them who just wanted to say something, so we could get a 15 or 20 second clip of them. Um, you know, shaking their fist and saying that they're with us and that we could put it out there. And the, the leaders in the legislature are getting retweeted on all this stuff. So the head of the Senate, who really didn't have this on his agenda, or the head of the Assembly that didn't have it on his agenda, or the governor's office didn't have it on their agenda, they're seeing their rank-and-file folks coming to our meetings and us putting it out on social media. And that was extremely effective for us. Um, getting the legislators involved was huge. Uh, a lot of the legislators are out on Twitter. So I started friending them on Twitter. I started following them. And one of the things I've learned is if you follow somebody, they're so excited. Oh, I got another one. They go and they look and they see they got another follower and they go figure out who that follower is and they follow you back. Um, so I had the members of the legislature following me. 
Um, the campaign at our official campaign Twitter handle had the members of the legislature following us. So when a legislature said something like, hey, let's send the message that we need to support Be Fair to Direct Care, I'd retweet it. And the legislature would usually send a smile back, you know, because they know that we just took what they did and we tweeted it. As more legislators joined, we're now showing the legislators one-upping each other. I said something positive about this, now where are the other legislators? And as in any state, um, we have members of the legislature that are members of our community because they have a child or a relative that has a disability and receives services through the system. And they began as our champions, and then other legislators joined. And you can see the bottom tweet on this page, um, that's the chair of the Senate Mental Health Committee, who basically said in an outrage that he was outraged that the state budget that the governor put out in the middle of the campaign did not include funding for us. And so we took his tweet where he said it's imperative to help these folks. Um, we retweeted it and said what's not in the budget speaks as loudly as what is. Send the message to the governor that this is unacceptable. So getting the legislators involved and using their hashtags draws them in. Uh, they get involved in Twitter, um, and I think it's an increasing phenomenon, at least certainly here in New York State, where five years ago there was absolutely no social media. I'd say three years ago there was absolutely no social media presence. Um, Twitter is also a great way to share data. So we did a study on the uh, staffing crisis where all the DD providers gave us data, and we interpreted the data to show that one in 10 DSP jobs in the state is vacant. In some places, it's two in 10. We put out that study. We put it out by Twitter and by Facebook. And we did a press release, but the newspapers didn't necessarily cover the press release as much as the Twitter world covered the press release. And one of the things I'll talk about in, in a little while is we now see our reporters, our political reporters, are getting more and more of their information and data by Twitter not by walking around the Capitol, going to press conferences and getting press releases. That's really too much work for them as press rooms are getting cut down in size. If you give them the story on Twitter, they can retweet it and they can write it into their blogs because the blogs now, at least in Albany, the reporters' blogs are what drives policy, not the articles that they write in the print version of the newspaper, and the blogs are. So we went out and... Um, put the data out using Twitter. We put up a billboard in Times Square in New York City, which was donated to us by a family member who happens to have a billboard in Times Square. Uh, you know, it's, uh, they call it America's Backyard, and millions of people come through Times Square every year um, calling out the governor to get involved here. Uh, I don't think that it took five minutes before we got an angry phone call from the governor's office because not that the billboard was up, because the truth is, not that many people from New York State spend their time in Times Square. People from all over the world come to Times Square to, to, to go to Broadway shows or go to the Disney store or the ESPN zone, but they're not going to Times Square. But New Yorkers aren't going through Times Square every day. But the fact that we had the billboard up and then we put it out on social media, which is a pretty strong message, it got through very quickly. And so we put a picture of that billboard up. And by the way, um, you see my Twitter handle up there, at Kroll underscore Stephen. Every tweet I sent in this campaign is still on there. I haven't deleted them. You can go in there. You can see the tweets. You can see the pictures, the press releases, the data, any of that stuff, and use it as you work on your campaigns. Um, I'm going to leave that up there in perpetuity to memorialize Ruffert, but so other people can use it. So um, one of the things that I recognize is when you start following people, they'll follow you. So the reporters began following us. So as our campaign took hold, I started you know, tw like, um, making myself uh, following the reporters. The reporters looked back and said, oh, these folks in the IDD community, we're going to follow them. So I started now getting my message out through the reporters because it was easy for them. So here's a case where um, the reporter from the main Albany newspaper, um, the Times Union, actually tweeted out that he asked the uh, head of the State Senate and the head of the State Assembly of what areas of agreement they have in the budget, and he pointed a funding for direct care workers, meaning our Be Fair to Direct Care campaign. So I have a reporter tweeting about our issue, and I took that. I turned it around. I tweeted it out to the whole world, uh, including the leaders and the governor, basically saying, hey, the legislator's on board. Governor, where are you? And so we were able to build this Twitter community of policymakers 
reporters, legislators, and I think that ultimately is one of the things that led to our success. Um, as you can see, um, we declared victory on Twitter. Uh, we, did a, we did an in-person press conference with the governor. Um, he basically uh, went from disinterested to saying that he would veto any budget that did not include this money. Um, in a time when money is hard to come by, he found the money, and he put together uh, we, so here we put photos of the rally with the governor out on Twitter. We put a link to the Times Union blog story out on Twitter, and we use that to get the message out. So I encourage people to think about Twitter. Um, I, the way I did it is I would start, I would write a message and discover that it was 200 characters long instead of 140, and I would start thinking about the little shortcuts I could take. Uh, whether it's, you know, at, you know in, in regular English grammar, you're supposed to put two spaces after a period. Well, you know what? If you're doing it on Twitter and you need to get rid of, find a character, get rid of the two spaces. Just do period in the next word. Nobody cares. Um, you know, you could say T-Y, capital T, capital Y, instead of thank you. The word and can be replaced with an N, with the, with the and sign. You really can get a lot in in 140 characters, and uh, so I would encourage folks to try using this in their advocacy. There's no question that this was the, the, the thing that turned the tide for us. Certainly Facebook did as well. Our Facebook page for Be Fair to Direct Care is still up there. You can see all that stuff as well. So um, thank you very much, and um, I'll turn it back over to Doris. Great, and we'll have Steve and Linda on at the end of the session for questions too, um, just as a reminder. So I'm just briefly showing some tweets that were used in the Save Medicaid campaign, which revolved around the health care debate this past summer. Um, in particular, we had an advocacy day on June 6th where Anchor and other coalition members joined together for a rally plus a lobby day during which time you know, there were hundreds of tweets that went out that went to millions of people because they were shared by different networks and broadcasted. So the tweets that you're looking at on the screen were seen, I believe, by at least over 10 million people um, nationwide. So yes, to echo Steve's word, it is definitely something to consider. Um, so I'm going to transition us now to Facebook campaigns, just to give other examples from the private sector about ways that you can creatively engage. So the first example is from a company called Bikini Luke's, which went from being these absolute nobodies that no one had heard of to having half a, a quarter of a million people within two years looking at them. So when you look at you know, your average feed, it has maybe 200 or 300 people, and suddenly you have these guys with a quarter of a million people suddenly, and within two years. They are getting a lot of attention in the business world. The Forbes wrote an article about them, for example. And one of the ways that they got the message spread out was by requiring their companies to be brand ambassadors. Mind you, we are not telling you to have your employees parade in a bikini. Like, seriously, don't. Um, but we're sharing this highlight to help you think about how you can involve your employees, the person serves, your families, and your networks in your activities to strengthen your voice. So sharing video testimonials, asking them to write emails, asking them to uh, post on Facebook, asking them to go live. You know, it's a little video function when you're on Facebook where, um, one second, I was just told I have an echo. Um, right. Hopefully this fixed that. Um, but basically, like it's the, going live is a little video on Facebook where you can see what somebody is doing exactly at the time they're doing it. Um, and the reason for that is that the broader community that providers are members of are going to be your best advocates. So it's completely worth it to tap into them. Like my, an, an example of one of these companies' tweets, uh, I mean Facebook posts, is here, you know, they just show their employee holding a camera out on the beach, but they tagged her, and they also tagged a whole bunch of other people using their own networks, and it was a reward. It was an incentive you know, in the modeling world, especially for a bunch of people whom this person could not have interacted with to be able to see. Um, now, mind you, that because the IDD world is unique and differently crafted, we do have to be careful about permissions, so I would recommend 
keeping in mind if you're going to use photos, obtain and document the permissions. Likewise, when you're talking to your employees, you would be asking them to do this using their personal accounts. You know, this is their voice, their experience, their take. So you might want to have some protocols on the best way to do that. Like, you know, what does it mean when you're sharing something that your company wrote on your Facebook? What does it mean when you are becoming an ambassador? What other posts can you have? Can you not have? Just have a conversation up front. But you'll see that it'll really broaden your message. Um, so that's why I want to flag this campaign. I also want to bring attention to the Like a Girl campaign that was held by Always, um, which is a tamp the pad and tampon company. But they were having trouble engaging with millennials. Like younger women were just not paying attention to them that much. And they addressed this by understanding where they needed more allies and what voices they wanted to hear. So the girls wanted to be empowered. They found this weak point, you know, a point of criticism, like a girl. It's usually used negatively, and put a spin on it. And it's important to have that human experience. That, emotion, that touch of emotion, just because you have a catchy slogan doesn't mean that your ca content can't be heavy. Um, so, you know, here you have this book. These are screenshots that I took from the video you know, where a girl was talking about how she was being pressured to not follow her sports uh, because of gender norms. It's not light content, but with a catchy slogan and a nice positive spin on the video, it got a huge amount of traction. Like they had, I think that face that uh, YouTube video that they were sharing through Facebook has like 6 million views on it. So broader audiences. Um, and now I'm going to transition to the third branch of social media, Snapchat, which is really the baby on the scene, but it's the third largest social media company, and most of the people using it are in that voting age block which means that while its advocacy potential is still developing, political campaigns in particular are paying a lot of attention to it. 49 members of Congress have accounts. Um, and you can see, like looking at some of those names there, especially in the last healthcare debate, these aren't insignificant members of Congress. Like, none that any of them ever are. But these are people who had a lot of clout beyond their state who are joining in all now because they're no, they know they're talking to future voters and current voters. And it's by nature, you have to use your phone when you're taking pictures using Snapchat, and you have to basically use selfie mode, which means that you're always seeing who's taking the picture. It means these members of Congress have to be very hands-on because they're always going to be the ones holding the phone at the moment that the picture is being taken. It makes, so they just pay a little bit more attention. What Snapchat has been getting a lot of attention for, and the reason it's so popular is filters. So as you can see, it's just little things that you can superimpose over your photo to make it look goofy. But harking back to an earlier point, and I have no qualms whatsoever about sounding like a broken record, advocacy is constantly evolving, which means that these filters are now getting very political. Um, and in the example in the middle, so you would have your photo with like, you know, met little microphones t specifically targeting Senator Cardin. It was the first time that this was used. Like usually campaigns overall don't target like a specific politician. But on Snapchat, this is becoming used a lot more in part. Like It's still not massive, but it is be increasingly becoming used because of Secure America's first use um, two years ago. And because it's ephemeral, so when you send something, especially in the private function on Snapchat, and in the appendix, we have explanations of what that is. It only stays on the screen when you open it for 10 seconds, and it's only available to be seen for 24 hours, which means there's a lot of incentive for elected officials to go in there and check what's being said just because it has their name on it. They want to know what's being said about them. Um, and if it's going to disappear in 24 hours, they're going to check often. Um, so it's, again, the Internet is growing. So now I'm going to conclude at least the social media portion with some, some uh, key tips. And you can see what they are here. I'm not going to dwell for long. Again, you'll be able to download them. But you know, the three C's that you need to remember are catchy, so ha have your message grab attention, clear, make it clear what it is that you want people to hear, and convenient. It has to be easy to be seen. 
and a lot of privacy settings aren't necessarily set to public. So remember, you don't just want your friends to see your message. If you're tagging a directed official and your setting is not public, they won't be able to see it. So you have to make sure the whole world can see this. Um, and that's what makes it convenient for people. So I'm going to touch now briefly on email campaigns. We all know what email is. I don't really think I need to explain that, but my husband is actually the one who answers emails for his senator. And so I want to give you a bit of that like, congressional insight on what it means. The big takeaway here is that the staff who are in D.C. offices may or may not have ties to your state. But you know, because the Senate is inherently local in the sense that it takes care only of one state issue, even if it addresses national issues, they want to constantly keep track of what's going on at home, take the polls, get a sense of the climate. And the best way for them to do that is by email. You know, like if you send them physical mail, it'll spend two months in like the post office that's within the congressional building being checked for anthrax. So email gets to them quickly, and they get a sense of where people are at and what people are thinking. So when their boss goes back in the Senate, I mean, goes back um, home over August recess, over all those long weekends, they have a general idea what people are going to want to talk about. Um, the way they do this is through tallies. So email, well. A personal story really stands out, and they can use them for speeches. Like the main way they think about email is how many people are talking about this, and what is the breakdown between happy or unhappy. Um, so they can tell when an email is being mass produced, but it still matters because it's falling into this count of like happy or unhappy, and people are mobilizing. That's something that, you know any office will pay attention when a lot of people are getting together and talking about one thing and mentioning them. Um, so while always, you know, if it, you can send a personal email through your account on your time, it will be more effective. But participating in, in uh, action alert tools is also still handy because it's building up those tallies. So now we have some time left for questions. Um, I'm putting up like a quick key takeaways, but really the main thing of that is, you know. Think about it ahead of time. Don't approach social media necessarily as a game. It can be light, it can be fun, and you can act on the fly. It's inherently designed for that. But if you have a strategy and you think ahead of time of who you want to speak to and who you want to see your tweets, you'll be that much more effective. Before I move us over to questions that you might have, and remember to have questions if you type in the lower, oh goodness, I apparently got cut. Um, hopefully you all can see what's happening. Um, in the lower left-hand corner, you'll see a little chat box. So if you have questions, enter them there. Before we head over to questions, though, I'm going to apparently get kicked out of my program. Linda, Steve, do you still have the slides up? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. All right. It looks like my brief t um, tech problem is now solved. So I'm just going to quickly show the appendix so you have an idea of what's in here. Um, but then I'm handing it over to Linda and Steve for questions. So you know we have a glossary. We have a step-by-step -step tutorials on how to open accounts, and then a whole bunch of links to advocacy tips, more in-depth tutorials that literally show you like you know how do you open, how do you post a tweet, how do you have. How do you tag? Like all those things. A sample tweet that we've sent out just to break down the components and let you see why we did what we did. Likewise on Facebook, more in-depth tutorials, anatomy of a post, more resources on Snapchat, and finally, list where you can find your congressional um, usernames. Mind you, both Steve and Linda have shown that you can use this at the state level, and it's probably more effective there because you're talking about a smaller pool. So I'm going to shift to questions now. We've received one. Um, and Jody Hansen wants to know why the presenters used their own personal Twitter accounts rather than their agency's account. So Linda, Steve? Yeah, I can answer that for me. Um, I used both accounts, and uh, so I was, I was rather busy tweeting. But I wanted them to see my face <clears throat> as well, um, to see that as a community member, I was speaking out, but also as the executive director of Avery Inc., I was speaking out. Uh, my personal account has my picture. The Bay Area account did not. And so uh, I, you know, I would show up at hearings. 
um, they would see me. They would see me on Twitter as well. That's why I use my personal account as well. Uh, my answer is similar to Linda's. Uh, we used a Be Fair to Campaign account. We used each individual agency that was a member of the campaign's account, so in my case, NYSARC, and then we used my personal account. Um, the reason why I wanted to make I, – so I just chose one of the three for, for using today. Um, but one of the reasons why I think it's important to have a person associated with it, uh, I was the, the, the agency leader or a member of the team of agency leaders that were in there negotiating with the governor's office, negotiating with the legislators, advocating on our behalf, speaking as the MC at the rallies, placing op-eds in the newspaper. Um, so I think that your advocacy becomes uh, a, a, a different, has a different level of effectiveness when there is a, a real person that the legislators and the policymakers have to respond to when you come walking down the hall into their office and they see well, that's the guy that I'm on Twitter all the time. Um, so I think you need to have not only the agency face on it, but a leadership face on it. Um, it does not need to be a person such as myself who is a an executive, it could be a voluntary board chairperson, it could be a parent, it could be a self-advocate, but I think there has to be a face um, that they have to respond to because it's very easy for people to, for a campaign to get written off because you're faceless. So that looks like all the questions we have. Let's give it another couple minutes in case the audience is mulling anything over. Again, if you want to post, um, there's a little snap, uh, a little chat box over in the uh, bottom left corner. So while we're waiting, Linda, Steve, any last-minute words you want to share? You, you gave a lot of resources. This is Linda. You gave a lot of resources for getting information um, on how to use Twitter. Um, there's the Twitter glossary. You can Google the Twitter glossary, and it'll give you a lot of assistance and support twitter.com. And so uh, that, that will answer a lot of questions about hashtags and tagging people, um, notifications, and the like. And so I would um, encourage you all to look at that when you set up your account. Yep. I, um, I'll also add on, on the end that you don't have to have a crisis to get involved in doing this. Uh, it is a great thing to use to raise awareness of our community. And if you begin using Twitter to raise awareness, when we so so right now we're in a lull in the congressional um, deliberations because Congress is home for the summer. We know they're coming back. We already know that there are lawmakers that are going to want to take another run at repealing the ACA. That are going to want to take another run at providing at, at making hundreds of billions of dollars in Medicaid cuts. While today we may not be able to affect change in Washington because they're not there we ought to be out there talking about the faces of Medicaid. And this is a great way to do it at the local agency level, um, getting people to know who the people are that are going to be affected if the ACA repeal ever comes back on the table, who's going to be affected if the uh, Medicaid cuts ever come back on the table. We know that there are people out there who are just sitting down at home now trying to figure out, okay, we didn't get it last time. How are we going to try it this time? So why not be preparing by raising our profile in a positive way so the next time they come after us, we've got the social media ready to respond. Thank you, uh, Steve and Linda. I don't see any more questions. I do want to reiterate Steve's last words. Medicaid will definitely be on the agenda again in the fall, in part why we're doing this series in the summer is so that you have time to prepare. Um, anchor staff are always here to help answer your questions. You know, if you need help with your overall strategy, who to target, what kinds of messaging to use, when to engage, just reach out to us. We are here. Um, so I will 
thank you all for the time. Thank you, audience, for joining us. Thank you, Linda, Steve, for sharing your great stories. And with that, I'm going to conclude this webinar. Thanks. Good day, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you.